Good evening, everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Yong Choi, the chair of the Department of Library and Inf Information Science at the Catholic University of America. And on behalf of the faculty, staff, students, I welcome everyone to the Sister Thea Bowman Social Justice Lecture Series. Thank you for joining us. I think we are uh, okay to start <laughs> because it's six o'clock. So. so we feel very privileged to host this year's Sister Thea Bowman Social Justice Lecture Series in November, which is the National Black Catholic History Month. So the speaker uh, will deliver his lecture about 30 minutes. And during the presentation, attendees are in listen-only mode. But you can type your questions by using Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. And our graduate student, Jennifer Wintel, will monitor questions. So today's speaker will answer your question after the presentation. But if you have a general comment, please use the chat button. So we are a uh, chat button as well. We are recording tonight's lecture event, but recording available on our website will only show the speaker's presentation. So now I am very pleased to introduce Dr. Barrett Mera, the speaker of this year's lecture series. Dr. Mera is EBSCO Endowed Chair in Social Justice and professor in the School of Library and Information Studies at the University of Alabama. As a survivor growing up with child abuse and domestic violence in India, and as a gay scholar of color in the United States, he is privileged to find his atypical voice through social justice scholarship and advocacy in library and information science. Dr. Mehra's research focuses on social justice and social equity concerns in LIS and community informatics to empower minority and underserved populations. He has authored over 175 peer-reviewed publications on equity, diversity, inclusion, accessibility, and international social justice content. He is also the book editor of Emerald Publishing's Advances in Librarianship series. The title of his lecture is A Voice from Intersecting Margins to Further Social Justice Scholarship uh, and Advocacy in Library and Information Science. Please join me welcome Dr. Barrett Mera. Great, okay, thank you. Good evening to all of you here from Birmingham, Alabama, the cradle of civil rights movement, struggles against racism that exists even today for social justice and advocacy for our brothers and sisters, Black Americans, and all of us immigrants and other racial ethnic minorities. So the title of my talk is re relevant from that geographical positionality. I want to first thank my with deep appreciation and sincere thank you to Professor Yang Choi in the Department of Library and Information Science at the Catholic University of America for her invitation to deliver a talk for the Sister Thea Bowman lecture series on social justice in library and information science. This generous invitation is also personally meaningful to me for I recently realized, thanks to conducting research related to this talk, that one of the places that Sister Thea Bowman taught was at the Holy Child Jesus Catholic School in Canton, Mississippi. While my mother studied at a convent with a similar name and my father studied at the St. Columbus School, both in Delhi, India, premier missionary established schools during the British rule. I am truly honored and delighted to present brief glimpses of thoughts and work that highlight conceptual, philosophical, and functional dimensions on social justice threads that can help us extend the impact of our work in librarianship and information science outside our bastions of privilege that we all belong to. The goal is to develop resistance to hegemony, and I'm privileged to find my voice through my positionality and role to make us all uncomfortable as we continue to become stronger in our quest to further social justice and develop our humanity, human dignity, respect, and potential to the fullest. There is need 
to decenter white privilege, dismantle white oppressions in a predominantly white centered majority, challenge policies and practices that perpetuate systemic racism and other isms to integrate mechanisms of action oriented accountabilities beyond lip service for in intentional or unintentional racialized behaviors when they emerge as systemic patterns. This talk is one small step in that regard to implement authentic anti-racist practices within white dominated professional groupings of library science education and practice and information science and all that is part of our professions. My talk is delivered with kindness, empathy, love, yet accountability and urgency to make a difference in the lives of all human beings, especially those who are considered on the margins of society owing to social, cultural, political, economic reasons, historically and in the contemporary world. The invitation to deliver this talk has helped me gain knowledge, reverence and understanding of the life and work of Sister Thea Bowman, 1937 to 1990, religious sister, civic, civil rights advocate and candidate for sainthood who dedicated her life to service emerging as a light, shining brightly to carve out a path to racial justice and intercultural understanding within and beyond the Catholic Church. I was able to send similar threads of quest for humanity and human dignity, as well as the service and struggle that Sister Bauman experienced in the face of blatant racism, inequalities and civil rights resistance in her native Mississippi, with the similarities of social indignities, marginalization and cultural taboos society imposed on the people dying of HIV AIDS, leprosy and tuberculosis that I grew up hearing about the work of Mother Teresa's missionaries of charity in India. In following the tradition of past speakers referencing to a land acknowledgement statement, I will first share the statement from the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities uh, that has that they talk about, for example, in quoting them, we the United States has achieved many great things, but it has also a complex history and dark and cruel periods, including the mistreatment of Native Americans and the taking of a great deal of the land, unquote. And quote, while we cannot change the past, public and land grant universities have and will continue to be focused on building a better future for everyone, unquote, and more. So here you see the Theodore Tuscaloosa, Shelton State Community College in Alabama, provides an indigenous land acknowledgement statement adopted by its board of trust directors in 2020 that recognizes that the organization, infrastructure, and the larger Tuscaloosa community are built on Choctaw lands, while the surrounding region encompasses Creek territories as well. The histories of many native nations are deeply rooted in Alabama, while the present and future lives of our neighbors, including the Poarch Creek, Mississippi Crot House, and other tribal communities remain closely connected to this land." Unquote. Within a neoliberal commodification of equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility topics, we see many such statements which might come across as lip service when there are few efforts of reconciliation, retribution, decolonization actions, identification of specific strategies to dismantle and rectify wrongdoing, wrongdoings, etc. So then we have on the other hand of the lip service, the University of Alabama's University Lands and Real Estate Services coming from the Division of Finance and Operations. And on their website, they provide an early history of university land management only after 1884 when the US Congress voted to grant the university 46,000 acres of public lands to increase the endowment of the university as repayment for the destruction of the university campus during the Civil War, unquote. There is no, with no reference to how the land was taken from indigenous populations. This is a great example of whitewashing the white brutalities and the telling of white sanitized histories. Also, it maybe represents how entrenched white institutions of privilege function. It is the way it is that is probably not going to change. That is the unspoken message. 
The University of Alabama's Division of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion is currently celebrating the Native American Heritage Month that you can visit and find information on its website. Conspicuous by its absence is what are we doing about the retribution beyond the lip service superficiality. No acknowledgement of the people and land we stole wiped out nearly their entire existence. No reconciliations, not even a lip service, feel good statement. As we stand on the lands that white exclusionary elitist institutions of colonial power that we are part of completely destroyed. Social justice begins at home. I'm aware that the presentation might upset some fragile sensibilities in our collegiate. This perspective of a person of color might also cause some palpable discomfort. It is important to get on the documented record that my colleagues, Dr. Cook and others have indicated several times, though I do want to make it clear that the intention underlying my presentation's delivery today is with kindness, empathy, love, yet accountability, urgency, and drive that I see at this moment in time. Justice as a mode of practice means speaking with compassion, integrity, healing, flourishing, and resilience. The talk is not with anger, but with thick skin persistence. And my purpose is to make us all uncomfortable so as to make us stronger and better in addressing racial equity, racial diversity, inclusion, accessibility concerns beyond lip service in authentic ways. So racism intersecting with patriarchy is a global disease that we have inherited. We all have owing to the dysfunctions of the human condition. In the United States as human beings, we experience ignorance and power imbalances owing to the pervading cultural sickness of whiteness that causes lifelong damage to the body, mind, heart, and soul, and requires an intentional and systematic approach of helping each other as we shall overcome together. I have my doubts, but in the shifting of positionality, I will have, I'll start with probing uh, problem, problematic questions. And so at the foundational level, talking about uh, the shifting of positionality of the EDI content, which have become buzzwords these days, that were until recently invisible on the margins in the LIS professions to now where they are privileged commodities of desire in the contemporary neoliberal realities of today. My question is, is it better for us from the fine plan of marginality and peripheries of situated location to the center of dysfunctional and unhealthy delusional journey in LIS that we have traversed. The question emerges from my observations of nearly 24 years of white men and white women, LIS administrators, managers, directors, educators, and leaders of associations who were and still are steeped in their whitest, that is white and elitist, garbs of exclusion and racism, hugging closely their whiteness of privilege, elitism, exclusionary, anglo european technology-centric, post-positive paradigms that emerge in an inward-looking insular academy, micro and macro aggressions targeted at people of color, eraser, invisibility, whitewashing of their work and whatnot, while pushing their white leadership of EDI content steeped in ignorance as they now fall over themselves to grab a piece of the EDI pie as the latest fad in jumping onto the bandwagon. Question number two related with our relationship with external constituencies, whether it is LIS scholarship, research, practice in libraries, LIS education and others. How can we truly believe that our external, cons external communities and stakeholders and the people we provide our information offerings to will seriously consider us of value when we continue to perpetuate white saviorism and white privilege condescending patriarchal modes of vocabularies, policies, practices towards them? including examples of viewing them in terms of information-centered, biased notions of deficit. Needy, for example, the concept of information need. Helpless, in purely academic, theoretical, abstracted ways of information-privileged language that stays disconnected from impact and changing people's everyday lives. And then the third question focused on internal looking insight within ourselves. Why are we surprised? when our professions are losing membership and not attracting many people of color in the face of EDI, lip service, 
invisibility erasure, quite fragile marginalization imposed on people of color in our midst. And with no credible, credible records of social justice action when problematic incidents are brought to attention. No efforts to dismantle white privilege slash white oppression, create accountability mechanisms, take tangible and transparent actions of change by responsible modeling of communication and interaction behaviors by all in our midst. So my critical push is for authenticity, integrity, and accountability in libraries and among affiliated stakeholders, considering their historical and ongoing collusion with systemic racism. So within these neoliberal forces or corporatization and control in the American Academy and LIS commodification of EDI content, I will share glimpses of my journey illustrated with some work related to research, teaching, engagement, grants, scholarship to push the pendulum in making an impact at a professional, social cultural levels, yet channelizing and giving representation to aspects of who I am as a human being and how life experiences have shaped me in challenging racism and other isms. So here you can see an outline for the talk today. Situating my positionality and social justice advocacy in LIS. Over the course of my 24 years associated with LIS educators and practitioners and they encountered racism, micro and macroaggressions, invisibility eraser, toxicity towards people of color has not changed and needs to stop now. However, what has changed is the lip service, tokenism, neoliberal commodification of racial, ethnic, EDI content. So that has changed tremendously. From the people like you comment by a white male faculty member towards my research, categorized and thrown into the service bucket during an interview in a Southern University for a faculty position in 2004, to some recent hypothetical examples. One, a white male administrator proud of their long years in the academy justifies his preferential treatment towards an accomplished male color of color researcher. I'm supposed to, I'm supporting a white female. How can you call me anti-diversity, unquote, with no clue of intersectionality or men of color in this country having been lynched and killed for speaking to a white woman, indicative of the historical and contemporary culturally biased hierarchical order. Second, or hypothetically, a female calling a colored male colleague a dog that needs to be tied and leashed and sees no problem with it. I can go on. What I will say is that white people in charge of race ethnicity related EDI matters have not shown much clue as they also try to misappropriate content without giving fair due where they pick up ideas from. For in our privileged white exclusive networks, the only way place academics, especially post positivists, think that they have to attribute without being charged with plagiarism is in published form that too from high, only high impact journals. Or third, hypothetically, when we see white dinosaurs in charge of race, ethnicity related EDI content in library associations, leadership, accreditation networks, etc. How all of these people think that it's wonderful what they're doing is indicative of the cluelessness that we all are in and how, how very far we are from any meaningful solutions. So situating biopositionality uh, in conditionings of life journeys and genetic makeup intersections, thus speaking up and speaking out to make people uncomfortable flow in my cultural and psychological veins. It is probably up to readers to determine from readers and listeners to determine from the interpretation of the nurture versus nature debate born this way or social conditionings intersections. But I do know and have noticed the intentional discomfort that I cause white administrators and others in my point number one, resistance to the hegemonies, calling out the hypocrisy, lip service, power misabuse and more. Point number two, speaking in some of my non-white English that automatically, automatically makes them deaf to my voice and of blinders suddenly emerge literally as a glazed look in their eyes. Third, and or my atypical neurodivergent, non-linear, meandering, divergent perspective and the semi-autobiographical point of view. So as a survivor of fire, but as a survivor, the fire of social justice burns deep. Two, point number one, confront forces in the external environment that perpetuate hegemonies and power imbalances. Point number two, propose actions to change debilitating circumstances. Point number three, destabilize 
biased notions that systemically pedestalize few and unfairly leave out others on real and symbolic margins. These are some of the themes you will encounter in my brief talk today. Also, intersectionality. Our life experiences are shaped by interlocking forms of privileges and oppressions and the cultural challenges, potential opportunities, identities, and conditionings. For my spiritual healing and emotional and psychological health as a survivor, I could not continue to enable its dysfunctions and stay silent. Hence the need of the hour to speak out and speak out, speak up and speak out about the violence of invisibility, eraser, micro and macro oppressions that we continue to encounter in our midst owing to these problematics. As a gay scholar, activist and person of color, it's a, in a heteronormative and white centered academy, I often employ critical narratology, that is narrative building, to decenter traditionally unquestioned imbalanced power attributed to post-positivist positivist paradigms of quantification and more. The concept of voice from critical multiculturalism uh, provides me the language of resistance to the narrative in the academy and its abstracted theories that exclude full forms of humanistic and interpretive approaches, mixed methods, participatory the action research, qualitative narratology, ethnography, participant observations, and others from the privileged box categories. I also take ownership of my neurodivergent, atypical divergent mode of thinking, communication, and poking at the hegemonies. So uh, the context of my select academic scholarship and publication record, if life gives you mangoes, make banana juice. Ah, over 24 years, I have been really fortunate to integrate my personal and professional streams of life experience and develop a distinguished national and international reputation as a scholar and advocate for underserved populations in librarianship and information science, engage in critical and activist scholarships towards a more inclusive and just society. Some spotlights have been identified on this website, on that particular page, sorry. So what is social justice and inclusion advocacy in LIS? Let's start with a few uh, conceptual definitions and meanings. Good place to start is with Paulo Freire, Brazilian educator, activist, and philosopher who writes in the Pedagogy of the Oppressed in 1970, quote, to the oppressed and to those who suffer with them and fight at their side, unquote, quote, knowledge emerges only through the restless, impatient, continuing, hopeful inquiry human beings pursue in the world, unquote. The key goal here is transformations beyond the white middle class privileged legacies of librarianship in its colonial and imperialist world order. So a social justice and social equity perspective in LIS promotes activism and advocacy to support fairness, justice, equity, equality, change agency, and community development via information related work with and on behalf of all people, especially those considered on society's margins. What does social justice in the field of information look like? An impact driven concept of justice that expects information professionals to better operationalize and implement social justice in ways that are fair, just, inclusive and equitable. The concept of impact relates to the actuality and possibility of LIS professionals to make a difference in the everyday lives of people and generate those social, cultural, political, economic outcomes that are meaningful to them via information related work. The push is for social justice and LIS to generate community based social justice impact that are intentional, deliberate, systematic, rigorous, constructive, asset based, action oriented, and outcome driven. You might find it meaningful to read a book that I re uh, recently edited this, this year on social justice design and implementation in library and information science that presents a range of case studies that have successfully implemented social justice as a design strategy to generate community-wide changes and social impact. Social justice in LIS seeks to achieve action-oriented, socially relevant outcomes through information-related work. So a few glimpses of my social justice advocacy and scholarship in LIS. The, these glimpses connect EDI action research, social justice and community engagement and attempt to adopt social justice actions for impact to decenter white privilege and white oppressions. 
in order to challenge entrenched mechanisms, systemic privileges, oppression, prejudice, neoliberal corporatization and commodification of social justice. How do you continue making a difference when we are deeply immersed in those realities? Action, do something about it. Find a personal voice of empowerment. Speak up and speak out. Question hypocrisy, lip service, tokenism, and other tools of white fragility. So related to conceptual and theoretical uh, foundation of social justice in LIS, this chapter presents the actualities and possibilities of representing social justice and social equity concerns in LIS by extending Ranganathan's five laws of librarianship within today's contemporary neoliberal and geopolitical realities. In the chapter, I also draw attention to blinders in librarianship identifies in its resistance to intentional systematic action oriented community engaged impact driven strategies of social justice and social equity for real change owing to its whitest white and elitist roots. These are speculated in relation to the profession undervaluing of Ranganathan's contributions because of his South Asian, that is East Indian origins as a result of the pedestalizing of its Anglo Eurocentric components within the legacies of a colonized and imperialist world order at the time. A manifesto of social justice laws of librarianship is proposed to address past and recent lapses in allies. So related to external communities, you see information researchers apply, this applies to act, uh, practitioners as well, can further social justice and social equity to meet the needs of minority and underserved populations experiencing intersecting modes of cultural marginalization. This article proposes an impact driven framework expounded through five interrelated elements. Why, that is the motivations, with who, that is engaged constituencies, how at external and internal levels to change traditional practices and towards what goal, which then need to be articulated in specific projects and activities. The urgency of critical and reflective conversations is important within information research outdated in multiple contextualized needs of contemporary times. Historically, situating impact-driven social justice research is important to further the relevance, existence and growth of the field of information as it strengthens its tie with ICTs for development. Social justice in teaching and innovative pedagogies, the article presents my critical pedagogies and reflective practices as an instructor of three graduate courses taught in LIS at the University of Alabama. These included social justice and inclusion advocacy in fall 2019, diversity leadership in information organizations during spring 2020, community engaged scholarship in fall 2020. The courses explored a new theory practice impact discourse in its deliberate system systematic rigorous impact driven and action oriented agenda. Student enrollment from across a multidisciplinary college year established interdisciplinary interconnections of relevance. Required course readings refle uh, reflected content across local, regional, national, and global contexts. Similarly, students' community immersive projects in all three courses represented social justice contexts of learning, scholarship, engagement, and action. These varied in their degree of impact across boundaries tailored and individualized based on each student's interests, context of study, unique opportunities, and project development, as well as inclination captured on, that they captured on their own websites. So let's do a quick reality check in LIS. When people who have not directly experienced race, social inequities and imbalanced power dynamics through the lens of race ethnicity in the United States and elsewhere, proclaim EDI initiatives, these fall terribly short, for it is based on abstracted theoretical notions without direct experience. In the shadow of uniquely American struggle for racial equality, who are we historically in LIS professions and how has it shaped who we are in the present? An honest acceptance is important to realistically move forward in the future. Mehra and Gray discussed these trends during six normative phases in LIS and called for an owning up of racialized library history, whitest information research, exclusion in LIS education, lip service of LIS diversity, self-deception that is, tokenism and limited inclusion in LIS and retribution and reconciliation for real transformation to occur. Over the years, a lack of social justice in LIS is evidence in its exclusion of people of color in its composition and service constituencies, gender inequalities in salary differentials, 
the continued privileging of post-positivist and positivist research and a bias against qualitative interpreted or humanistic approaches. And of course, you can read more about that as they emerged in the six phases that are listed here. So uh, as I take my hat off to Elfrida and Mary Chapman, 1942 to 2002, who is considered a pioneer scholar for her theory development and ethnographic approach to understand information behaviors of understudied populations, example, female inmates, janitors, the elderly, poor people, uh, female retirees, etc. in LIS. In this critique, I also focus on the dysfunctional cultural inheritance in the problems of LIS scholarship within which Chapman's work was positioned during the exclusionary white standard academic settings. Some narrow threads in the trajectory and scope of information science research of those times included newly incipient qualitative research within the dark shadows of quantitative approaches, solely stuffy information focused theory development, owing to the biased Anglo Eurocentric sociological anthropological disciplinary roots, that too, which internalize positivist, post positivist approaches and representation of research solely delivered through exclusive networks, limited community impact, societal uh, significance, limited explanation of complex realities of marginalization, information poverty, etc., only looked at through information centric, simplistic hypothesis, research on them instead of with them broad generalizations and simplistic statements, glossing over richness of the lives of the research participants, etc. As a result, we have encountered some unnecessarily distracting problematic dimensions over the years in the growth and evolution of the LIS professions that include inadequate and poor bridging of the theory practice discourse, few illustrations of impact, action-driven research, inability of the professions to make a difference beyond our privileged bastions of academic environments in the everyday realities of underserved users in ways that are truly meaningful to them in terms of economic, social, political outcomes, marginal engagement with community-based information agencies, adoption of inadequate participatory design, widespread exclusion of minority voices, etc. This editorial calls for social justice actions in libraries and the possible ways the professions can move beyond solely performative anti-racist politics, considering their historical and ongoing collusion with systemic racism. Responding to the contemporary social unrest against racial injustices in the United States, we witnessed even entrenched white privilege establishments, such as libraries, universities, government organizations, and corporations with documented evidence of institutional racism, uh, embrace anti-racist rhetoric and verbiage. Seemingly, these agencies were capitalizing on the traumatic situation without acknowledging their past predominant passivity, that is silence and neutrality towards racism within majority of their constituents. The critique challenges solely performative anti-racist acts of libraries and others portraying a false public image within neoliberal agendas. It calls for reconsideration of the library's identity beyond a politicized cultural product for social justice actions that serve as a counter narrative to hegemonic patterns of pretense in their recent predominant performative anti racist politics. The performative is in the blood that flows through the cultural veins of libraries in the United States. Many libraries are taken by the white fragility construct when people of color in allies have been trying to make visible the white hostilities targeted at them and the underlying reasons for a long time. Robin D'Angelo, 2018. Conceptualized white fragility, I tell us as an original and the title of a book, as a process of life reality in the United States in which white people are socialized into a deeply internalized sense of super superiority that we either are unaware of or can never admit to ourselves, such that we might become highly fragile in conversations about race. The mere suggestion that being white has meaning often triggers a range of defensive responses. These include emotions such as anger, fear, guilt and behaviors such as augmentation, silence, and withdrawal from stress-inducing situation. These responses work to reinstate white equilibrium as they repel challenge, return our racial comfort, and maintain our dominance within the racial hierarchy. In fact, it is a powerful means of white racist control and the protection of white advantage. The social, cultural, political, and economic upheavals in the wake of Ms. Rona's pandemic 
have worsened the lived experiences of people during the crisis. These disturbances have been situated in uncertainty and anxieties owing to mismanagement and spread of dis or misinformation, manipulation of news and social media, misuse of science to serve political and economic agendas. This article discusses how can libraries of all kinds and affiliated LIA stakeholders, including practitioners, educators, administrators, and students, respond to these chaotic uh, realities of disbelief, witnessed almost daily over several years now, emerging from misleading political networks, frenzy mongering news media outlets, and vested economic interests. So, framing context and the question why are men and women of color so few in the field of information, library science, information science, LIS education, etc.? We see the talk and pretense and lip service with no actions to rectify power abuses and decenter white privileges. Then we consider why there's so few men and women in LIS and those who are left or driven out. For example, the officially approved ninth principle added to the ALA code of ethics added on June 29, 2021. We were all sleeping all these years, right? The elite since Association for Library and Information Science Education Ethical, Ethical Guidelines for LIS educators adopted in 2010 with their biased Judeo Christian feel good hegemon of the majority, no actions to address issues of incidents when they are reported, of mistreatment, eraser, invisibility, etc. Since no policy statements are reflecting actions of change beyond declarative statements about race, ethnicity related EDI concerns, during my past experiences with LIS, we see perpetuated misbehavior and problems becoming systemic in the professions. So here is a dismal number of people of color in the 2021 Elise statistical report. And so here we can see the numbers speak for themselves. So I've identified major problems in the past report that still exist, including the fact that there is an absence of representation or number, numbers based on race, gender intersections in LIS education. Is this an unhealthy symptomatic behavior of a poor awareness of intersectionality? And or is it a cover up of the marginal interlocking white and female collegiality that forms a majority? Further kept complicated is a simplistic post positivist variables with no definitions of international merge with race ethnicity for each respondent to interpret as they choose, making the reported findings haphazard. Problematics in a national context, easy to forget that the passage of Civil Rights Act of 1964 in the United States was legally enacted not very long ago to ban employment discrimination on the basis of race, colors, religion, sex, or national origin, abolish disparate in voter registration applications, force public school desegregation, and establish racial desegregation dis dis of public accommodations in federally supported housing and in the workplace. Much has been debated about the lumping into the same box, the sex and race, color, ethnicities in terms of national origin as problematic. Is it connected to the lack of men of color in LIS education and privileged leadership networks? You can see one article uh, by the CN, CNN political commenter, Sally Khan, about affirmative action helping white women more than anyone else. So several times have encountered in leadership opportunities in LIS and in the academy filled with white women. The predominance of race or whiteness pervades. It is always the top category of white men and everything else into one lumpy category. And the status quo of white male privilege stays intact. Two people of Asian origins from the same country, even when they're American citizens, cannot be selected for leadership opportunities in the same cohort. Even though there are many white men and white women in the leadership positions and the rules definitely don't apply to them. Then an Asian woman will always get selected over the Asian man because patri patriarchy is considered a bigger problem, race being the same for both in simplistic problem problematic post positive modes of measurement. So the Asian man cannot do anything, whatever what level of credentials he might bring to the table to overcome the gender card. Drawn on his face several times by white men, white men administrators who can continue occupying however many seats they want. So my delicate question is, should we continue to hide behind laws and policies as followers that we know are unfair and biased and limited in continuing to maintain the white men at the top status quo? Or we emerge as true leaders to establish ethical policies that fix the problems beyond lip service 
to address the white oppression. So uh, white females in LIS education rightly complain about the privilege bestowed on white males in the profession and the world at large. However, when some of them take on leadership positions in administration and management, they end up replicating similar systemic abuses and oppressions that they themselves find hegemonic and then enact out similar behaviors of invisibility, eraser, power abuse, and more towards men and women of color in their midst. As a majority in LIS education and the professions, they assume that their relationship as friends or mentors to each other entitles them the privilege to have their problematized racialized behaviors overlooked. No wonder men of color are so conspicuous by their absence in our professions. And it reminds me uh, to several quotes by Paul Freer again, first of them, but almost always during the initial stage of the struggle, the oppressed, instead of striving for liberation, tend themselves to become oppressors or sub-oppressors. The very nature of that thought has become conditioned by the contradictions of the concrete ex existential situation by which they are shaped." Unquote. And then the last quote at the bottom here, although the situation of oppression is a dehumanized and dehumanizing totality affecting all of us, both the oppressors and those whom they oppress, it is the latter who must from the stifled humanity wage for both the struggle for fuller humanity. The oppressor who is himself dehumanized becomes he dehumanized, dehumanizing the others. It is, uh, he is unable to lead the struggle. Sick, the male gender pronoun. Some actions moving forward. Moving forward, the, the concept of elements from transformative justice and the paradigmatic approach in shaping our conversations in LIS is a worthy uh, uh, was the uh, strategy. Ruth Morris's transformative justice recognizes that all realities are constructed and shaped by social, political, cultural, economic, and racial ethnic values and are critically reflective of power as important determinants of which reality will be privileged in a research context or in other information related circumstances. Integrating attributes of uh, transformative justice in allies processes, practices, behaviors, relationships, and scholarship means owning up to these social racist, whitest, and exclusionary tendencies beyond social economic inequalities that are there and have always been central to allies power and privilege in manifold, manifold dimensions of our contemporary existence, as well as taking actions of meaningful change. So as my role uh, is the series book editor in advances in librarianship, uh, I'm spotlighting social justice uh, an inclusive practice from the shadows to become an emerging canon in the way and that can then form the very core of who we are and what we value as legit in NIS scholarship and practice operationalizing new directions of critical perspective for single or multi-authored book length explorations and edited collections by shifting focus on understudied spaces invisible populations from the margins knowledge domains that have been under research or underpublished reflective journey that established or newly emerging LI scholars, researchers, practitioners, and students critically reflect, assess, evaluate, and propose solutions or actions to change entrenched practices and systemic imbalance inequities in different library information settings, as well as decolonizing LIS publication industries in their biased euro annual center cities with inclusion of content from geographical diversities around the world. So if you're please interested in, please reach out if your work fits in within these categories and I'll be happy to have a discussion. Some of the recent works that are emerging thanks to this new role include uh, a doctoral student who has transferred their work into, uh, into a monograph, single authored, towards new possibilities for library and information science, the use of social media in the 2018 West Virginia's teacher strike by Scott Sykes, I am being working with Dr. Kimberly Black in Chicago State University on anti-racist library and information science, racial justice and community, collaborating with Casey Williams Cockfield on a book on how public libraries build sustainable communities in the 21st century, collaborating with Julie, Dr. Julie Nichols on a work data curation and information systems design from Australasia, impl implications for cataloging of indigenous knowledge in galleries, libraries, archives and museums, Collaborating with Dr. Vanessa Irwin on a, on, a, on, a, on a project, Reading Workplace Dynamics, a post-pandemic 
professional ethos on public libraries, and then working with Dr. Laili Saifi from Iran on social justice in library and information science uh, in the Islamic Republic of Iran. So closing with a few uh, collaborations and opportunities that have emerged recently thanks to funding from uh, IMLS grants. First of the project, Civic Engagement for Racial Justice in Public Libraries. We are, uh, I'm collaborating with Dr. Kimberly Black from Chicago State University and looking at public libraries in the Southern Library, 16 regions and Washington DC in the United States and looking at assessment evaluation feedback, translating that into strategic planning workshops, and then operationalizing and implementing aspects of civic engagement for racial justice in 11 different community domains. The second one is collaborating with Dr. Bob Ryder at the University of Alabama, relating to training and educating BIPOC community embedded social justice archives, where we are in the process of admitting 12 BIPOC paraprofessionals who are, who are embedded in community-based realities and who are, and we will be providing an online curriculum which focuses on building bridges between social justice related work and archival studies uh, 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 aspects of the, of the work in order to develop tangible products while they are in the program. And then the third project with Dr. Elisa Lant from East Tennessee State University in developing, co-developing in a participatory design process a professional learning program to build capacity of library staff to support diverse young children and their families in maths. So these are just a few uh, examples of current activities that I'm hoping to pursue, uh, pursue in order to continue building impact and generating, making a difference in the lives of our external communities. So I will really be happy to get uh, engaged with all of you in the limited time for questions and answers and closing with the statement white power, privilege and oppressions are a part of our, of a sickness that impact all of us in our intersectional realities and identities. This presentation opened up the conversation about some of these matters. The answers are not much solidified. However, it is a start. The theoretical construct of voice provided me the privilege as scholar and activist to spotlight on matters of my concern. It illustrated an epistemological understanding of how knowledge of experience can emerge in the context of the dysfunctions in the profession. The strategy helped me contextualize my response to the eraser, invisibility, abuse of white power that is intentionally or unintentionally imposed upon people of color and allies. Moving forward, the new challenges include how do we decenter sickness or white privilege and call it out in public forums to destabilize the power that was reflected in this presentation as one approach. So please reach out and let's discuss how we can collaborate to promote social justice and impact-driven scholarship research practice while information alert, uh, related work in real and meaningful ways. Thanks so much for your patience and uh, uh, your attending of this, uh, of this presentation. And I look forward to having uh, questions and answers. Thank you, Dr. Mar